Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to come in here and share with you a little bit about myself and why this race for Secretary of State is so incredibly important. And I want to thank you all for all the work that you have done in Cobb County. Um, I know that this legislative session, we really saw Republicans bring the hammer down on y'all because of the progress that you have made. And I'll go into that a little bit more as I share with you some of the things that are also simultaneously happening at the legislature and why they're so instrumental to protecting our democracy and our fundamental right to vote. My name is Representative B. Wynn. I represent House District 89. That is DeKalb, Atlanta. It's the seat that was formerly held by our future governor, Stacey Abrams. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so she left really big shoes to fill. Um, and, you know, before I ran for office, I would spent 10 years working in our Atlanta and DeKalb public school systems. My family, they are refugees from Vietnam. They left in the late 70s. Before my parents got here, my dad was actually held as a prisoner of war. He was a political prisoner locked up for three years in what they called re-education camp, where he was subjected to hard labor, starvation, and who knows what else. When he was released, he decided, along with my mom, that they were going to flee their country to seek the same civil liberties that are under attack here in our country today. Now, when my parents came over, we had a president from Georgia by the name of Jimmy Carter. We know that President Carter is known for being a humanitarian. He made a really hard decision at that time. He said, I'm going to increase the number of Vietnamese refugees we take into our country. And it was a decision that was very unpopular amongst Americans. And that's been the history of our country. My parents, they resettled in America. We moved to Augusta. I was born in Iowa in 81. We moved to Augusta when I was about seven. And I had a pretty quiet immigrant household upbringing. My mom and my dad said, you better keep your head down, you better study hard, you better make good grades. And they said, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, and at the very worst, you can be a pharmacist or an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> they believed that public education was the key to getting out of poverty, and it was true for my family. But they also had a very narrow perspective of what that meant. I knew I wanted to do something different because here's what they didn't talk about. They did not talk about the importance of building community power. They did not talk about the importance of building political power and not for the sake of having power, but for the sake of using it to demand the changes you want to see for your loved ones. And they never ever said, you must wield your fundamental right to vote at the ballot box because they lived in fear of their government. So they did not know that we are here in our country should be empowered to do that. And so I ended up starting an education nonprofit working in Atlanta and DeKalb Public Schools. I was in the classroom every single week with, ten years, with kids for 10 years. And in that classroom, I saw the power of the General Assembly. They were the ones deciding not to fund our public education system. They were the ones who decided not to expand Medicaid so my kids didn't have health insurance or dental care. They were the ones deciding not to invest in affordable housing, secure housing, healthy foods, public transit, all the things that young people need in order to build a successful economic future. That's what compelled me to run in 2017. Now, you all know that being a Democrat in Georgia is not easy. You all made it easier in Cobb County. <laughs> My friend and colleague, Representative Eric Allen, he will tell you the majority of the time we spend fighting against bad legislation. Sometimes we get to do a little bit of good. And one of the things I am most proud of is being able to overturn the exact name match voter registration policy. I remember when that was passed. <laughs> Stacey Abrams was my state rep and she went down to the well and she said, if you pass a bill that says your name on your driver's license has to exactly match the name on your voter registration. You know who will get caught up in that system? People with non-Anglo names. And it turned out to be true. We saw the margins in 2018, right? We said 50,000 votes. Well, this one policy froze the voter registrations of 53,000 Georgians. 80% Black, Latino, and Asian. 
One of the reasons I was over able to overturn this policy was because they couldn't spell my last name correctly. <laughs> they spelled it wrong when I was elected three times on the state website in three different ways. Every single time I got a committee meeting notice, it was spelled wrong. So I showed up in committee, I had a stack of papers, and I said, look at all the times you misspelled my last name. How can you have a policy predicated on clerical error, and here you are, you cannot spell my last name correctly. But you all know these policies are designed to do exactly as they intended it to do, which is suppress voters. And every single year I have served, there has been some bill introduced to make it harder for Georgians to vote. My first year, an attempt to eliminate Sunday voting. One year, the attempt to roll back our city of Atlanta municipal hours from 8 p.m. to 7 p.m. We were able to fight those bills back. In fact, I remember Senator Warnock, before he was in Senator, came down, stood in front of our Capitol with us on a day as cold as this to fight back against those bills. But everything changed in 2020. And I think you all know why. Representative Eric Allen laid out the case of how we got to 2020. They saw the gains that we were making, and they started very early on to sow seeds of doubt as it pertains to vote by mail, the security of absentee ballot voting. That is a policy, but no excuse, no ID. That was passed by Georgia Republicans to increase rural turnout. They used it in greater numbers than us every single year until 2020 when we were trying to vote safely during a pandemic. And they did it in my committee. They started a coordinated campaign in Georgia so they could set us up, so they could try to overturn the results of the election in 2020. That's exactly what they did. I watched as Rudy Giuliani and Trump's legal team start traveling across the country. And then they came to my committee. And people said, you may want to think about sitting this one out. We are really concerned about your safety. Not only are you a woman, but you're an Asian woman. And I said, well, I did not get elected to stay silent. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than Georgia. This is about our country as a whole. So I made sure that I did my work to discredit Trump's expert witness. And as soon as I was finished, my name, address, put on a right-wing gun site, and people said, she's a traitor, call for her execution. And then the usual racist, xenophobic, and misogynistic things lobbied at me, and I had to make a safety plan. And I thought, how are we in this moment in our country when we're using truths and facts, and we're being met with death threats? But it was happening all over, not just to me, elected officials all over, and election workers all over. Now, I thought January 6th was the precipice, but it was not. We went into a legislative session where Republicans, they said, you know what? We're not gonna talk about expanding Medicaid, giving over half a million Georgians health insurance during a pandemic. We're not gonna address the fact that the Department of Labor has not answered the call of my constituents who have lost their jobs and homes and cars. We are not gonna talk about the fact that kids have been out of school for a year and they're, they're gonna return. They wanted to do one thing and one thing only, pass a massive voter suppression bill. A two-page bill turned into a 98-page bill, and yes, it criminalizes handing out a bottle of water to a voter waiting in line. It reduces the use of absentee ballot voting. It reduces the use of secure drop boxes, which were so popular that our own governor used it. But here's what it also does. It opens the door for the subversion of democracy. It allows a partisan state legislature to take over our local election boards. You all know local election boards are instrumental. They do decide early voting. They do decide early voting location, whether or not a county is going to have Sunday voting. But here's what they also do. If you remember in 2021, a conservative group from Texas came into Georgia. They challenged the voter registrations, the voter eligibility of over 464,000 Georgians. Our local election boards rejected those challenges. But imagine suspending Fulton County installing one superintendent of their choice, and that one person makes the decision on who is eligible to vote, who they keep on the voter rolls. That overturns the results of an election. That changes the results of an election. And here's the thing, they're not done yet. This legislative session, you saw, they broke our home rules, they violated democratic norms, they went after Cobb County School Board, they went after Cobb County Commission, and when we brought up in, in committee, is this constitutional? They did not care. Did you follow 
Section 2 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. John Carson said he didn't know what cracking and packing was. He said that out loud. But rest assured, he said, these maps are fair. <laughs> we know they are not fair. We know they are utilizing every mechanism they have to overturn the will of the people. And just a few days ago, they dropped a 40-page voter suppression bill, and they fast-tracked it out of committee so that it will hit our floor on Tuesday, crossover day. And we say, could it get worse? Yeah, it can get worse. You know what's in this bill? Now, our ballots, they take the seal off, which means any person can go in and request open records requests and delay the certification of an election indefinitely. They also said, hey, guess what? Under Senate Bill 202, you know that provision of how our local election boards were able to get over $40 million of funding to hire more people, buy more equipment? They said, it's not good enough that we've taken that right away from local election boards. We're now taking it away from counties. That way your county can't get the money and give it to your local election board. Now it has to go before the State Board of Elections where they get to make a vote, a Republican controlled State Board of Election. So they're crippling our election boards, they're taking the money away, and they're putting our workers in danger. That's what's going on at the Georgia legislature. That is why this seat is going to be so incredibly important. It will be one of the most important seats here in Georgia and across the country. This is a safeguard to our democracy, not a silver bullet, a safeguard, and a necessary safeguard. There is a national effort right now. They have looked at Georgia, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and they have recruited far-right candidates. In Georgia, our Trump-picked candidate, Jody Heiss, voted against the certification of the election. He voted against awarding the Capitol Police who defended our Capitol on January 6th the Congressional Medal of Honors. That's their guy on the other side of the aisle. That's what we're facing. He's exactly the person who would find the extra votes, who would refuse to certify the results of the election. And here's what they're banking on. If they can just win in one swing state, i.e. Georgia, and they install their guy, when it comes to 2024, he doesn't have to certify the results if he doesn't like him. This is no longer about 2020, it's about 2024 and the outcome of the presidential election. That is why we have to take this seat here in Georgia. Now, I'm gonna answer the question people ask me most frequently. What can the Secretary of State even do under these conditions, under Senate Bill 202, under a Republican controlled legislature? Yes, we want to be able to vote at any precinct to end use it or lose it or vote or purging. We want all of those things but that requires legislative approval. So what can you do without legislative approval while we are litigating these voter suppression bills with a Supreme Court who has not shown us very favorable outcomes? Well, there's a lot that we can do. One, we have got to elect a Secretary of State who will support our local election boards. As Secretary of State, I would not throw them under the bus like our current one does. That means funding, that means training, and that means protecting our poll workers who have been the subject of harassment, threats, and intimidation. Two, we need to turn the Secretary of State's office into an entity that educates and is an outreach for voters. This is now left to candidates, to county parties, to C3s, to C4s. The Secretary of State doesn't believe that they're responsible for making sure voters know where to go to vote. Voters know the new changing laws of when they should request a ballot, when they can receive it, where they can drop it off, who can drop it off for them. I'll give you a quick example. Voter purging. The Secretary of State's office has to clean up the voter rolls, removing voters who have passed away, voters who have moved. We have an additional requirement, use it or lose it. You sit out on multiple election cycles, your peg of inactive, they send you one postcard in the mail. I don't know any candidate who's just gonna send you one postcard in the mail. <laughs> They'll probably lose if that's all they do, right? When it comes to keeping eligible voters on the roll, we have to in good faith invest in that 
outreach and communication. That means mail, email, phone calls, and texting. My phone will buzz in the middle of the night. That's an Amber Alert. My trash isn't getting picked up, 311 text me. They have all of our information. There's no reason why we should not be doing in good faith outreach to keep eligible voters on the roll. The third thing, language access. I grew up in a household who speaks English as a second language. We only have one area of Georgia that's required by federal law to translate. That's Gwinnett County, and we have to translate into Spanish. There's actually a current court case in the 11th Circuit of Appeal. So they're translating in Spanish in person, but they're saying, you know what, we actually don't have to do this for vote by mail. And the argument is, well, we're actually not violating equal access under the law because they can just show up in person. And the judge who is conservative says, well, why can't you just put a button on the website that says Espanol? Because they don't want to, there's no political will. We can, translate into the top spoken languages, election materials, corporations material, licensure material, that is meeting voters where they are, it is investing in our workforce, it's automatically expanding access. The fourth thing is building a division to mitigate misinformation, cybersecurity threats, and foreign interference with our election system. Misinformation is one of our biggest threats. It means working in tandem with federal, state, and local law enforcement, with our election boards, with our community. And when those threats are being identified, we do the work to make sure that we mitigate those harms. And the last thing is something very unsexy, but pragmatic, because this is about finding solutions to a system that is attempting to drown out our votes. It is creating a kiosk, just like Department of Driver Services, this kiosk would enable you to print out your application to vote by mail. We now have a new law. It says you have to have a wet signature, pen and paper. So we can't even do it online anymore like we used to. My printer has been broke for probably two years. <laughs> I have to call people and say, can I come use your printer? So maybe you print something. You can go into a grocery store, print out your application to vote by mail, sign it, scan it in. You scan in your acceptable form of ID in. You can renew your registration, your corporation's registration. We identify areas of Georgia with low access to broadband, areas of Georgia where we know people may not have printer scanners, and we put them in grocery stores, post office, libraries. We're meeting people where they are. And last but not least, I will certify the results of the election whether or not I like them. <laughs> are one to two elections away from a constitutional crisis. We have to get this right here in Georgia. I grew up in a household where my family did not talk about what happened to them a whole lot. But one of the things they would say is, you know, we saw the writing on the wall all of the signs were there, but we never ever believed we would lose our country. And we are in that moment now. The signs are there, the writing is on the wall. We have seen it this legislative session. The local redistricting, the hijacking of those maps in Cobb, Gwinnett, Richmond County. The PSC maps, yes. where they just two yes. days ago drew somebody out for their benefit. We have seen the way they are attacking our public school systems with censorship bills. And they just dropped a bill that says, hey, guess what? You can't talk about gender in addition to race. They have a bill that makes it a felony for you to protest on a highway. Voter suppression, gerrymander districts, censorship in classrooms, Attacks against freedom to assemble. These are our fundamental rights that they are attacking now at the Georgia legislature, and they are not slowing down. So we have got to keep our foot on the pedal. We've got to win these statewide offices. And we have got to pick up seats. Because yesterday, the speaker had a vote on a bill to break a tie. 
That's how close the margins are now. So even if we don't take the house, picking up those seats moves the needle. It makes a difference. And you all know more than I do how much of a difference it makes being in Cobb County. So thank you all so much for the work that you have done. office and thank you Eric Allen for running over and over and over and over again. <laughs>